Hello there! In this video, we will be learning about the data types in c -sharp. So the agenda of my video will be what are data types and then we are going to discuss about the various types of data types in c -sharp. So it will basically be split into two parts, value types and reference types. So let's get straight into it. So first, like I said, I'm going to talk about what are data types. So data types specify um, the type of data that a variable or field can hold. So c -sharp basically is a strongly typed language. That means that we must declare the type of the variable which indicates the type of value it's going to store. So data types are divided into the following categories value types and reference types like i said so first we're going to talk about value types and then we're going to talk about reference types so let's get straight into it so as i said that first we'll be talking about value types Va value data type variables can directly assign a value which I'll st show you in the Visual Studio demo. So value data types are derived from system that value type. So value data types will directly store the value, not the reference like how it's for a reference type. So value types will accept both signed and unsigned values so value text will be stored in stack memory not like reference types which will be stored in heap memory if you want to learn about stack memory and heap memory don't worry i'll do a video on that too so next we are going to talk about signed and unsigned integral types so what integral type means that it stores some numeric values. Okay, so here we have a column with some alias names. So for um, some, we have s byte, sort, integer, and so on. And we have a type name. That is nothing but the dot net framework type of what the alias names here. So for example, an s byte. So what internally happens is when we type in s byte in our c -sharp code, then the compiler internally converts that s byte to system dot s byte. So then we have a column for the type. That is nothing but simply for saying if it's a signed or an unsigned integer. Again, Take the example for um, byte. So byte is an unsigned integer. And then another example of short. So that is a signed integer. Next, we have a column on size. That's for the size in bits. So take the example of short. So short takes up 16 bytes and as for long it takes 64 bytes for byte it takes 8 bytes for s byte it takes 8 bytes and so on so now next we have a column for range so again take the example of byte so byte can store a value from 0 to 255 so take another example of s byte so s byte can store a value from minus 128 to 127 so another example short so short can store a value from 32768 to 32 minus 32000 i'm sorry minus 32768 to plus 32,767. So then we have a column that is for the default values. So the default value, just again take the example of s byte. So 
S bytes default value will be zero. I take the example of long. The default value will be zero L. So L is a suffix for long. So I'll show you that in the Visual Studio demo, which we're going to do now. And if you have just declared a variable and assigned it a value that is not a decimal value, an integer value, then the compiler will consider that as an integer. So now I will show you these concepts in action in Visual Studio. Okay, so here I have fired up Visual Studio. So first I'm going to show you that you just, for example, you have a confusion on what's the min, minimum value and maximum value of any data type and integral type. So now I'm going to type in a console that right line method, okay? Tab. And then I'm going to display on the console saying, um, byte. We have the example for byte. Byte minimum min value colon placeholder zero and then in a new line so slash n byte max value byte max value colon placeholder I'll put a comma up to mark. And here I want to display the minimum value of byte. So I'm going to type in byte that min value. Okay. And then in the second placeholder here, I want to display byte that max value. Okay. So now it's time for us to run our program. So I'll put control plus F5. So now we can see that some values are displayed on the console. That is the minimum value of byte, that is 0 of course, and the maximum value of byte, that is 255. So if you assign a value that is lesser than 0 to a byte data type, then you will get an error. And same goes for the max value. If you assign a value that is greater than 255, then also you'll get an error. So now let's see if we um, kind of assign a value to a byte that is out of the range of 0 and 255. So I'll just close this. So I'm going to create a variable for your understanding. So I'm going to declare a byte. Um, I'm going to name this example equal to, let's see, 266 or 256, semicolon. So now we see we get an error. It is that constant value 256 cannot be converted to a byte. Now, to fix that error, we'll have to assign some value that is lesser than 256 or greater than zero. Before doing that, I'm going to assign this a value that is lesser than zero. So I'm going to put in minus um, 12. And again, you see there is an error. It says again, constant value 12 cannot be converted to a byte. So now let's see I put in 100. So that is in the range of, um, wait, Oh, I'm sorry, there's a minus in here. Okay. So now you see that our error is gone. So that was called variable overflow. So what variable overflow is that if you assign a value that is out of range of a data type, that's called variable overflow. You will learn in detail about variable overflow in one of my later videos. Okay. So whenever we are creating a variable or field in our application, we should really be aware of the type and range that our variable should store. And then choose the appropriate data type for that. So let's take the example for age. Um, so if you choose an integer as your 
data type for storing an age value, then that's really bad choice because an integer can store even negative values and even some value till 32,000. So nobody can have negative age, right? And 32,000 is too much for age. So you should choose a byte. A byte itself is more than enough for age because it can hold a value of 255. So, and then it cannot hold negative values. It's only 0 to 255. So, we should be wise in choosing data types in our application. So, we'll move on to the other things. So, next we're going to talk about floating point types. So, there are three types of floating point data types which contain the decimal point. They are float, double, and decimal. So first, I'm going to start talking about float. So it is a 32-bit single precision floating point type. It has a seven-digit precision, with me, which means that after the decimal point, it will have six, I mean, seven digits. So to initialize a float variable, use the suffix capital F or just small f. So like this. I have declared a float that is called x. You have to name your variables properly. This is just for your understanding. And then like I was saying, I have assigned it the value of 3.5 and I have put a f suffix after the value. So if the suffix f will not be used, then it's treated as a double. So next I'm going to talk about double. It is a 64-bit double precision floating point type. It has 14 or 15 digit precision. So to initialize a double variable, use the suffix d. But it's not mandatory to use the suffix because by default floating point data types are the double type. So next I'm going to talk about decimal. So the decimal type is a 128-bit data type suitable, suitable for financial calculations. It has a 28 or 29-digit precision. To initialize a decimal variable, use the suffix m, like as I've declared a decimal that is called y, and then I've assigned it the value of 100.25, and then I have the suffix m after the value. So again, if the suffix m will not be used, then it is treated as a double, just like for float. So next, again, we're going to do the Visual Studio demo. Okay, so here I have part of Visual Studio. So now I will declare a float variable for your understanding about the floating point types. So float and I'll name it example. Equal to 3.5. So now we're going to get an error. So what this error says is that so the little type of double cannot be implicitly converted to type float. Use an f suffix to create a little of this type. So as you can see here, it says that it represents a double precision floating point number. So to resolve this issue, I'm just going to put in a small f or just a capital F. It's all the same. Now I'm going to show you the same example using a decimal. So I'm going to make this a decimal and it should remove the f suffix. Okay. And now this error again says that the little type of double cannot be implicitly converted to the type decimal. Use an m suffix to create a little of this type. So again, it says that it represents double precision floating point number. To resolve this issue, what do you do? Very, very simple. M for the suffix or capital M. So now I'm going to make this a double variable. 
And let's see what happens. And we don't really need this M. So there's no error. Like I said, floating point um, number. So the default um, data type for floating point numbers is double, like I said, and it's not mandatory to add a D in there. So by default, again, it's a double. So it's proven that if you have to use a float or a decimal for floating point data types, then you will need the appropriate suffixes. So now I'm going to move on to, we're going to just continue to Boolean types. Okay, so like I said, we're going to continue on Boolean types. So Boolean types has to be assigned either true or false values. So values of type Boolean are not converted implicitly or explicitly to any other type, but the programmer can easily write conversion code. So like I said, we basically use Boolean to store true or false values. Um, so for example, we have a yes or no checkbox. So we can use a bool to store the answer from the user. So here the alias name, I have a column that is bool and the type name that is .NET framework type is system.bool. And the values it can store, like I said, again, true or false. So now we're gonna do the demo for boolean. So here again, I've opened Visual Studio. So now let's create a Boolean type. So bool, bool, I'll name this is an Indian. And I'll assign this true, semicolon. So now you see we don't get any error. So now let's see. I try to assign this some numeric value like 21. So there's an error. It says cannot implicitly convert type int to bool. And if we try to put a string value into, we'll get an error. Again, error cannot implicitly convert type string to bool. So I'll just make this true again. Okay, so now it is proven that a bool can only contain true or false values. It cannot contain anything like string, integer, and all that stuff. You saw that we got an error for that. So for a real-time application, um, we'll have we'll have to take in the true or false value, the bool value from the user itself by using checkboxes. So like I have coded here, is an Indian. So we'll ask the question to the user, are you an Indian? And then there will be checkboxes for yes or no. If he or she selects yes, then the bool will be true. And if the user selects no, then the bool will be false. So now let's continue on with the next data type that is correct. Okay, so now we're gonna get continue on with corrector types. So the corrector types re represent a UTF-16 code unit or represent the 16-bit Unicode corrector. So what UTF means is Unicode transformation format. So the alias name for corrector is char and the type name that is .NET framework type is system.corrector or system.char. Its size in bits is 16 and its range is actually Unicode characters and its default value is just escape character zero. So I hope there's no demo required for characters and while you're declaring a character, it should always be in single quotation marks. If you put in double quotation marks, it will be kind of like a string and you'll get an error. So now let's move on to reference types. So, okay. 
So here we are at reference types. So the reference type did not contain the actual data stored in a variable. They contain the reference to a variable. In other words, they refer to a memory location. So the built-in reference types are basically string and object. So that's what I'm going to be explaining. So reference types are stored in heap memory, not in stack memory, like how it's for a value types. And again, you'll learn in detail about heap memory and stack memory in one of my later videos. So now first, I'm going to talk about string. So string is almost similar to correct, a character, but it's a sequence of them. It's, it represents a sequence of Unicode characters. So its type name is system.string. So the string with a small s is the alias name for the system.string class. So the string with a small s and string with a capital S are equivalent. So I don't think that we will require a demo for even string because we have an example here, down here, and that is also the concept of string is very, very simple. Okay. So here I've declared a string called first name and assigned it the value of option. And then, so this is the one with the small s. Then I've declared a string and this is with the capital S. That's last name and then I've assigned it the value of Scylla. So if you put in console.writeline methods2, it will print them on the console. So again, I don't think that you require very much of a demo. I hope you're very clear about string and we're going to be using in the string in all of my videos and all of my videos. So next we're going to talk about objects. So, so we're going to continue an object like I said. So the object type is the ultimate base for all data types, base class for all data types in C -shell. Common Type System, CTS, which you will be learning in detail in one of my later videos. So, object is an alias name for system.object class. So, the object types can be assigned values of any other types, value types, reference types, predefined or user-defined types. However, before assigning values, it needs type conversion. So, type conversion between objects are called boxing and unboxing. So you will learn in detail about boxing and unboxing in one of my later videos. So that's it for this video guys. If you like this video, don't forget to like and share this video. Please subscribe to my channel for more. Goodbye till the next video.